Powered by Elodic Digital Marketing Solutions. The Couture 303 podcast is now officially sponsored by Dapper Turkish Barbers in Huntscross. You can find them on Woodend Avenue and they do the full service there. The hair, the beard, the ears, the nose, the cutthroat, hot towels, the lot. It's the only barbers I ever go to. Fantastic service, great lads. No need to book, just pop in and see them seven days a week. If you want a nice sick fade like mine, you will not be disappointed. The absolute best in the area. That's Dapper Turkish Barbers, Woodend Avenue, Huntscross. And now back to the show. The Couture 303 Podcast with Jay Viper. Welcome back, guys, to another very special episode of the Couture 303 Podcast. Now, today's guest, I've been doing this podcast now for almost two years, and there's certain stages where you get someone on and you feel like it's definitely a level up, and this is definitely one of them occasions. I'd like to welcome to the show someone who you will all know from Tidy, but there's a lot more going on that you may not know about. Please welcome to the show the very talented Mr. Lee Haslam. Here he Uh, is. What an intro. Well, you know. (laughs) I'm honoured. I've got, I've got to butter these people off, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I <laughs> First so and foremost, Lee, and I've said this off camera, though, thank you so, so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. It's a, it's a real honour to have you on the show. You, you, you know, you're someone I've looked up to for many, many years. And as we just said off, off camera then, uh, I think it was Tidy Behind the Five, first one I ever mm-hmm. went to. Absolutely blown away by the whole the spectacle of it all uh, and yeah. you were very much at, at the, the top of the mountain then it, it, with Tidy as well. So I know there's a lot to go on. But what I always do with all my guests, we go right back to the very start. So where mm. and when were you born, mate? Um, July the 25th, 1975, uh, in Aylesbury, believe it or not. Although I am a northerner, I was actually born down south. But uh, yeah, I'm so I'm an honorary northerner, should I say. <laughs> well, I've lived up in Doncaster pretty much all my life. So yeah. Uh, yeah. And what was uh, what was school like for the young Lee? Because <clears throat> obviously we're uh, similar age. I'm I turned forty nine in May, so we're, yeah, I think yeah, you might so have been in a year above me in school, maybe or something like that. Yeah, I mean school was pretty nondescript, really. I wasn't really into much thing. I was shit at sport, so um, <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't particularly <laughs> academic. Although obviously, uh, so when I left school, I didn't really have a clue what I wanted to do. I, I kind of thought I wanted to get into teaching. So I went to college and did um, a nursery nurse degree, which was yeah. so I could be, I was actually a qualified nanny yeah. for a number of years. Uh, yeah, I was the, only the second male nursery nurse to qualify in the whole of the United Kingdom, and that was in 1931. Wow. So I was a teacher to begin with in a primary school. Uh, How things go full years. circle, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get on to a little bit later. Yeah. Come back, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, come back. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, and then obviously uh, I taught in a school uh, in Doncaster, private school, for about four years. And then um, I was getting quite ill because obviously working with, with kids and stuff, I used to get tonsillitis all the time, like four or five times a year. And it used to knock me for six. And then it, it, my employers at the time said, look, you're going to have to do something about this because you can't keep having all this time off work. You're going to have to have these tonsils taken out. So uh, at 22, I had to go into hospital to have my tonsils taken out. And I had to have a month off work. So I thought, well, you know what, I'm bored. Um, yeah. I'll just buy some decks. Because at the time, a friend of mine, Stuart, um, Stuart Jones, took me to my first ever um, club, which was a club called Love To Be in Sheffield. Um, and went to watch J- Jeremy Healy play. And yeah. um, and that was kind of the day, night, should I say, that probably changed the trajectory of my life. Because from that point on, it was all all about clubbing, all about music. Right, okay. Well, we'll, we'll backstep a little bit because we're going to tag a little bit of time on this. You've nearly caught me whole podcast there in uh, fucking five minutes. <laughs> oh, trust me, I haven't <laughs> made Hopefully, hopefully I want to get an hour out of this. <laughs> so, so school, obviously, school, like, like a lot of people, I mean, you, you touched on something there. You didn't know what you wanted when you left school. I don't think yeah. anyone really does. And I think yeah. that's testament to the to the bad system that's set up. The, I mean, you get taught biology and chemistry and, and history and, and RE. You don't get taught about life skills and no. what, how, to, how to look after your finances. And you've got no yeah. idea. When, no. when, you, when you're 15, 16, all you really give a shit about is, is fucking football and girls and yeah, stuff like yeah. that, isn't it? Yeah. You don't yeah, know what exactly. you want to be. So what was your musical influences growing up then? Obviously, um, have you got, have you got, what was your home unit like, sorry, like family-wise? Family yeah, so... Um... My mum and dad split up when I was about nine. Um, Standard, moved... really, isn't it? It's, it's yeah, yeah. Um, very normal. Man. And that was that was it was a difficult time for me because um, 
I carried on seeing my dad for a couple of years, and then, but it just it was upsetting me more than anything. So we I stopped seeing my dad when I was about eleven. Okay. Um, but then my mum remarried when I was thirteen, fourteen, I think it was something like that. Um, and yeah, he my stepdad was amazing. He would you know he brought me up and probably made me the the man I am today. Really. So no brothers and sisters. No. I've got a, an older sister. Okay. Um, yeah, she's a couple of years older than me. Um, she. Uh, Chalk and cheese. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very much in, so, in what yeah. way? Just, I don't know. Um, it's, it's weird. I, I probably see my sister like two or three times a year, but we yeah. live like three miles away from each other. <laughs> but when we see each other, it's like we've never been apart. It's really yeah. strange. Well, that, we that, young... well, that bond, isn't it? I mean, you, you can't yeah, take yeah. that away, and I suppose. When we were younger, we used to be at each other like cats and dogs, you know what I mean? But yeah. um, as, you, as you get older, I mean, I've got twin girls who are... 13 going on 21 yeah and they're they're exactly the same they're punching the hell out of each other one minute and then best makes the next it's just I, i've it's got two little ones thing. at home now i've got i've got five kids all together um yeah. but my two youngest uh madison's nine and elliot's six and the same you know there's mm. not a day goes by where one's shouting at the other one or i was on my first and I, you know blah 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 but and especially more so for my little lad I know for a fact he absolutely idolizes his sister. He looks up to her so much, and you can see the way he looks at her and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. So, yeah. what was your like your musical influences as a kid? What were you, what what were you listening to? At home I used, I used like to be that? really into bands. In excess were my favorite band. You two wow. stuff. Like that. Um, I went to my first concert when I was nine years old, and my mum and dad dragged me to watch Dire Straits, which was <laughs> an interesting experience because all I remember about it was um, we stayed at a hotel in London. And all I remember was my mum and giving me a, I had a banana split before we went to the concert. It's funny the stuff you remember, did And I, and I, this is weird. This is the only bit I remember. And I actually gutsed it that much that I had indigestion throughout the whole <laughs> concert. And my mum was like a massive D- Dire Straits fan. She still is. And literally, I was sat there in in pain, and my mum just literally listened to me like, the whole concert. The shit. She was like, "You can now, <laughs> and I'm, I've come to watch these." Like, Money for nothing, yeah, and I had a really bad stomachache throughout the whole concert. <laughs> and then I, on the last record that they played, I started to feel better. Yeah, but my mum literally just ignored me throughout the whole concert. So where, where was the concert? Where was the concert? It was at Hammersmith, uh, Hammersmith Apollo. Okay. Yeah. 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 So you yeah, obviously you actually, you... Um, it's actually they actually recorded it. You can actually watch the video on YouTube of the concert, um, and I've watched it back a few times. It's quite funny actually. But all that, yeah, all, we the things you remember. <laughs> all I can remember is eating that. Every banana. time you have a banana split, you think. Yeah, I've never had one since, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. now there's a bit of a obviously I, I've I've done my research uh, to mm. the best of my ability, but there's a, a I don't know what exactly about the. Uh, the time and the chronology, if you like. Yeah. So when did you, or how did you end up getting involved in Music Factory Entertainment Group? Yeah. So uh, a friend of mine, who is sadly no longer with us, called uh, Steve Longley. Uh, he was a mate of mine. I was He used the lighting jock at um, a club in Doncaster where I was resident called Eden. It was called Eden at the time. And we were really good mates. I used to play there on a Friday night and he used to do the lights. And he was working at the Music Factory as a delivery driver at the time. Um, and he found out that they were looking for somebody to um, help with uh, Tidy Tracks in terms of doing like the club and radio promotion, but also as a trainee producer. Yeah. Um, so I, I didn't know any of this, by the way, at the time. So Steve found out, told Andy about me, Andy Pickles, who was obviously one of the Tidy Boys. Yeah. And Andy came into the club um and watched me play now obviously i didn't know any of this the first guy that knew of it was walking into the club and andy pickles was stood behind the decks when just before i was about to go on so as you can imagine proper shit myself <laughs> yeah. um but yeah we got on like a house on fire um we ended up playing back to back some of the night and had a good laugh and then at the end of the night he said look john i've got a position coming up would you would you mind coming in and having to talk about it. And obviously at the time I was still a teacher. So yeah. uh, I was like, yeah, why not? You know, it's a, a once in a lifetime opportunity. Yeah. Um, so I went in, had a bit of an interview and he offered me, they offered me the job straight away. So I was like, right, okay, what do I do now? Um, <laughs> so 
I quit. I quit my job and went yeah. for it. Sometimes you've got to take a leap of faith as well. So yeah, that, as I said, with the chronology, I wasn't. I wasn't sure how it all panned out. So yeah, again, that was what, what, um, that was nineteen ninety eight. So um, so yeah, I, it was back into the nineties. But that was just before things. I think. I think Tony had just been into and wrote the dawn of the wow. month before I started. Wow! Yes, yeah, so in my first week they were writing the Tidy Girls EP. So you had like Lisa yeah. and Savage, Rachel Auburn, and all there. So I'm like sat in this office, <laughs> never, never been involved in a record label ever. Andy was teaching me at the time. I'm, Andy was teaching me about production. So it was, um, it was all Jai Bunny. So yeah. he was teaching me how to make Jai Bunny mixes. Yeah. So for the first year that I worked there, that's exactly what I did. Yeah, I, I did all the Jai Bunny mixes. I used to do like um, they've got a the music factory. They've got a company called Master Mix. Yeah, I remember them. Yeah, used to do like ready-made mega mixes for that's DJs, right, yeah. virtual DJs and stuff. Yeah. So I used to produce those, and that's that's how I learned about music production. Yeah, using all. Akai samplers and stuff like that back in the day. And just before then, it was just it just turned digital actually, because before then they were doing it all cutting cutting. It was tape. tapes. I was actually telling yeah. him it's about that today. It's all, all, all yeah, tape, yeah. So, tape to tape recording and stuff. So it was a bit a steep learning curve, but I learned a lot in that first year. Obviously, learned about the, the record label. I was doing the club promotion stuff, which was basically just doing all the mail outs of all the records to the DJs, making sure I got the feedback back for the, and making sure the label manager at the time got all that information um and then in 1999 um they offered me the job as label manager for tidy tracks uh, tidy tracks and that was that was the start of golden years really yeah so we'll just but backtrack a little bit then because obviously like i say i wasn't sure how how it all panned out so how did you actually get into the because you said you would already you would rest into the club Mm. when when you first met andy pickles so go, go back to the very start Obviously, your mum's into dire straits. You know, you're yeah, not yeah. getting subjected to the to dance music yeah. from your mum. How, how did you start getting an interest into dance music? It was like I say earlier. You know, Stuart, my friend, uh, who I'm still best friends with now, he took me to a club, and that was like the day that changed everything. Because I was like, "What is this?" Because remember was, who was I on? Really heard anything like that or experienced anything like? That. Jeremy, so, you said Jeremy Healy was on. Do you remember who else was on? Jeremy Healy was playing at the Music Factory in Sheffield, and that was my the first club I ever went to. And then, literally from that point, I was I went clubbing every single week. Yeah, and it was Gate Crasher on a Saturday. Uh, we, there was a club in Sheffield called, um, well, it's still there now, called the Lead Mill, and they used to do a night on Friday called Rise. I used to go there on a Friday. Then on the Saturday, I'd go to Gate Crasher at Republic. And then um, towards the early 2000s, I'd, then on the Sunday, you'd go to Sunday Central in Leeds or yeah. Sunday Central in Birmingham. So it was literally three three nights a week, every every week, just living it. Was it a smooth transit? Was there a crossover point or was it, was there a... Can you remember where there was a specific point where you thought, I'd like to actually do this? Because obviously you've, you've yeah, gone from I, just... Well, from when not... most people went to clubs to go and dance, I never did. Train I went, literally, I would walk into a club, especially Republic, um, and my girlfriend at the time, bless her, she would go and well, off with her mates and dance. And I would walk upstairs to the balcony and just stand. Watch. And I would stand there all night and literally yeah. just watch the DJ. So, you know, my idols then were, were Scott Bond, who was the resident, um, and Tony DeVee. So, and but you'd watched them all just play, and that's how I learned how to how to do it and learn my craft really to begin yeah. with. And then when I at that point, I hadn't really wanted to, I wasn't really thinking about becoming, getting into the music industry. I was just, it was still a hobby. Yeah. Um, and then um, I got a, a gig in my hometown of Doncaster on a Monday night in the in a, a bar called AD43. Um, and the owner was like, look, there's nobody going to be here. I'm not going to pay you because on Monday night in Doncaster was like a ghost town. But I wanted to do it because it, there's a difference between playing at home and obviously playing 100%, on a big... 100%, yeah. So, so for nearly a year, I played on a Monday night in AD 43 and um, just played to next to nobody. But yeah. it taught me a lot because it, it taught me it was a different set of decks, different mixer. Um, and then from there, I got another residency in Doncaster and it just snowballed. It just went... I went from DJing in, in, in my bedroom to playing on a Monday night in AD 43 to then playing... Uh, on a Friday at Eden, and then on a Saturday at the Doncaster Warehouse, where I later became a promoter. And you were teaching at the time there as well? You were still a teacher at the time? I was still teaching at this time, yeah. 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 What age were you teaching? Uh, well, there were. it was from three up to six. 
Wow. So, so they had no idea how cool Mr. Haslam was. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but they, they had not, it was a while ago, some someone came up to me in a club and it would turned out that I actually taught them and the, you know, like 20, 20, years, 20 years earlier. And I was oh. like, you're kidding me. Uh, yeah, it made me feel very old. Do you remember what your first decks were? Gemini's belt Gemini, drive. Belt drives, yeah. It was like one of those, those beginner <laughs> kits that you got. Yeah, you DJ know. in a box. Yeah, exactly. And you know, the pitch was at the front and it was like the, the actual pitch can, was like about an inch long and the tiniest movement. I mean, if you could mix on them, you could mix well, on that's any... the thing, you see. Yeah. A lot of people start on belt drive and DJ in the box and the new Mark TT stuff and the Pro 150s. And like you say, if you can, if you can mix on them, mate, yeah. you know, when, when you get on twelve oh, tens, I, I I think I, I found from from my first experience, the first decks I got were twelve tens, and I had a, a friend of mine who had I think he had Pro One Fifties, and I remember he came round to my house to have a go, and he went, "Ah, oh, your decks are shit." <laughs> they're not. No, <laughs> they're, no, they're really good. It's yeah, just yeah. that you're not used to them. That's all. Exactly. Yeah. Went, yeah. So he, when you play on twelve tens, it's like. It's just a doddle, isn't it, really? So. Yeah, it really is. So when you first started the Music Factory Entertainment Group, mm. I, I imagine that must have felt like, wow, I've, I've hit the big time here because Jive Bunny at the time was absolutely yeah. fucking yeah. massive, wasn't it? Yeah, so to yeah, be a yeah, part yeah. of that must like, have felt surreal. I mean, the, one of the first things I did was actually mix a, a, a Jive Bunny album, which actually went to number one in Japan, which is one of my... Fucking hell! Japan! Played. Yeah, in Japan, yeah. Oh, you know? um, it was, it was, yeah, it was, you know, you, they talk about imposter syndrome. Well, yeah, guys, you walk into a place like that and it's like, well, you have to learn quick. But yeah, you know, I had some great teachers and Andy was really patient with me and taught me a lot. So, was Ammo was, there at the time as well? Sorry, was Ammo there at the time as well? Yeah, just... but Ammo was lived down in Kettering at the time. So, okay. he, he wasn't, he, he used to probably come up once to Rotherham because obviously that's where the, the office was in Parkgate, Rotherham. He used to probably come up once a week. Um, but yeah, I mean, the studios were always pumping, and then obviously towards the early two thousands, the likes of Guyver and and Paul Maddox were um, were in the studios quite regularly. And obviously, Guy, I, Guy and I worked quite a lot with each other. He used to engineer a lot of my stuff as well. So, yeah. um, and it just built from there. Yeah. So, so am I right in saying your first release was music was the drug? Music was the drug. That was the second release. The first oh. one was Here Comes the Pain. I oh, was that okay? So again, I yeah, got, that, got came, me, uh... that came first, which was obviously a bit more of a harder, harder track. Um, that sampled I, there. I, I remember that Scarface, wasn't it? Because sorry, the sampled Scarface, that didn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it, that that track probably took the best part of three months to get right, and it yeah. taught me a lot that process because going into the studio and the play to Ammo, and I'd be like, yeah, this is it, this is it. And Ammo would go, no, nope. <laughs> it's not. Go back and do it again. Yeah, we had this conversation with Paul right, Maddox, and that. we were saying, when, when when you've done something and you're so proud of it, and you think yeah. it's amazing, mm -hmm. but somebody with so much knowledge in the industry tells you, no, yeah. it's not good enough. Yeah. You've just got to fucking take that, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's a bit and, of pill to swallow, got, but... It, it got to the point where I was getting really quite frustrated with it all, to the point where I just wanted to scrap the whole thing. And then... I had a break for it for a few weeks. Went back in the studio because it was Paul Maddox that engineered that track with me, and um, he was he was getting as pissed off as I was, I think. Yeah. But um, in the end, we 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 got that uh, that that pitch bent Hoover sound in the record yeah. so well, and that. <laughs> yeah, and, and, but it just it taught me a lot about the A&R process very very quickly and how not just to settle for okay. You've got yeah. to writing a record is about. It's about the hook, and you've got to have a really, really strong idea and identity to, for a track to really stand out. Even more so in today's age, because obviously yeah. not as many people were writing music. But yeah. back then, if you wanted to write a track, you had to have a proper studio. You couldn't just do it on your laptop. So um, it taught me a lot that process. And then yeah. from then on, I kind of got it. And that's and then after that was obviously music is, good, is the drug and liberate and loads of other tracks that obviously did really well. Yeah. So the B side, the B side to uh, "Here Comes the Pain," am I right? Was it your save? Yes. Like, yeah. And I'm arguably, arguably, I think that's a better track. To be, yeah, to you be, know, you're, you're not the only one to have said I, I, that. But where did the, the the thought process come of getting a fucking it's, pink well, it's, actually, ball, it's it? actually an old record. <gasps> I actually sampled another record. Wow. Uh, by Mr. Ping and Mrs. Pong. It's called. Makes it's, sense. It's called <laughs> so, yeah, that's it's actually a sample. So a lot of people say that. Where do you think of it? It's, it's just actually 
somebody else's idea, which I just recreated. So wow. So so your second track, music is the drug, mm. arguably your 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 biggest track. I I, I yeah. would say. I mean, it was absolutely like when I first went to the tidy weekend there. I think it was Tidy Weekend the Five. I think it might have just come out then. It was huge, and it still to this day sounds yeah. absolutely fantastic. With was that? Did you watch the film first and, and get the yeah. idea, or watched the film first, heard the vocal, knew that was the right vocal, um, and then there was a track I was playing out at the time, um, which was actually a, re- a Tintin Out remix of. Do you remember Billy who used to go out with? Um, yes. Um, she, she did a track called Girlfriend. Um, which right, came yeah. out on Innocence Records and Tintin Out did a remix of it. Um, Billy and I was playing it out quite a lot. It's great, great remix. And I loved the, the chord progression of the of the riff that they did. So um, kind of emulated that, changed it around a bit. Um, that that record was made in four hours. It was it came together that quick, yeah, with oh, Guy. Oh, Guy engineered oh. it. We um that was on Fruity Loops. Yeah. FL Studio. Oh my yeah. goodness. I'd say yeah. it's weird, isn't it? Because there's, yeah. there's so much. That I, I had a little, a tiny dabble with music production. You, you may or may remember. We've never actually met, but I I, I made a track. Uh, I, I did a couple of the courses off Tidy. I think it was the uh, the Gaz West ones. Yeah. Uh, and I put a track together and I sent it to you. And you, you said pretty much what you just said previously. Listen, it's all about getting it. Yeah. Perfect. It, it, it yeah. good isn't good enough. It's got to be fucking amazing. You've got yeah, to yeah, yeah. Have the sounds have the right hook. And and again. I, I kind of took it on board. I was like, okay, well, if this is what Lee has them saying. It's it's got yeah. to be fucking gospel to me. And, and I, I I took took me lumps and it well music production wasn't for me, but what my point was then, there's such a debate now between which is better, FL Studio and Ableton and Logic and this and that. And then you hear a track like that and realize that was the one FL Studio. Those don't matter. The, the what you use exactly. the software to make music is irrelevant. You know, we teach on Tidy Pro. Um uh, mainly Ableton and Logic, but at the end of the day, what the, the process is, we teach more about the methodology of how to yeah. make a good record, not the mechanics of what door does, because everyone it's it's what suits you as a person, as a producer. So you can work on Ableton, you can work on FL. The process is exactly the same. You know, if you're writing music, it's, it's doing it in the, the methodology that we teach, the, the structure that we teach. And it's it's the idea. You've got to have that idea to begin with, because without, if you just go into the studio with no real guide and just you're just going to write a loop and you're going to get bored in three three hours and whatever, get just bin it. But if you go in there with the thought process of what you want to do, you've already got the idea in your head. You've got the samples there. It's a lot easier process to do, and a lot more enjoyable as well. I think that that idea became more. Uh, relevant to me when I see you, you guys put out uh, a track deconstruction signum coming on strong. Yes, yeah. And it, it's so basic when he's putting yeah. it together, and you, you listen to it, think of fucking nice. He's, he's just yeah. put fucking four four samples together there, yeah. and that's yeah, the, yeah. the intro. Stay yeah. straight away. And, and yeah. I think people get hung up so much now on it's going to have this effect and that effect and this plug and that yeah. plug in. And yeah. when you see the simplicity of a track that's so iconic as that, and how, yeah. and how he puts it together, that that really was an eye opener for me. That yeah, well, one of the things that we teach on the course is 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 you know it's all about sound choice. If you pick the round the right sound in the first place, then you don't need to go into EQ and try and change that key. Just pick the right sound in the first place. Do you know what I mean? And a lot there's a lot of little little uh, light bulb moments on the courses that we teach that yeah. people just go, ah, oh, right. You know, it is yeah. less is more sometimes. Yeah, It's I've, about I've gone... allowing the music and the sounds that you've cho- chosen to do what they're there to do, yeah. you, know, you know, without getting muddled up with other frequencies and other sounds and trying to put effects on to make it sound how you want it to sound. Yeah. Just pick the right sound in the first place and you'll find it a bit easier. Yeah. I, I picked up FL Studio a couple of years ago, just randomly. I thought, I'll have a little go at making tunes. I, I just kind of got back into DJing and I thought I'll have a little dabble at making music and, and I was I didn't really know what I was doing. I watched a few YouTube tutorials as you do and then I did the, the Tidy Pro course, uh, the Gaz West one and then the, yeah. the second one and the, from the track I made before to the track I made after it was absolutely night and day because yeah. again it's about the techniques and you know Gaz, for, for me Gaz was like the fucking 
the Holy Grail, you know, because he made yeah. these fantastic fat dirty tunes, which he says himself now, he listens back to now, and they're so muddy. They're so, yeah. and, you know, from a technical standpoint, he's not happy with them, but they yeah. were anthems at the time. So I, I learned a hell of a lot from them. Like, so how, how did the um the tidy pro stuff come out? Whose idea was that? Um, it was it was born out of lockdown, to be honest. Well, obviously, when when there was no live you know, from a record label point of view, um, it was Salmon um, and Ammo at the time, um, and they got me involved halfway through lockdown, and then I started running it for them, and obviously, and they've continued that for the past you know four or five years, however long it's been, working with the likes of Ben and and Xander and Sam and all these different producers that do varying courses on it. So obviously the the flagship course is obviously the one you mentioned, which is the twelve week production course that we do. We just we just launched the eighth series of that, which starts in April. Um, but we also do a lot of little bite sized what we call master classes, which are like two hour classes where, you know, we'll hone in on a, a specific subject. Like with tonight, actually, we've got one. Xander Club's doing one on sampling. I got the email before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, there's little things like that where that people can just um, unlock little nuggets of information from people that they might want to learn about. Yeah. So, how long were you? So, did, did am I right to say you you left Tidy for the for the time or? Have you... Yeah. So I, I started at Tidy in ninety, I think it was ninety seven or ninety eight, and I left in two thousand and seven. Okay. Um, and I left and went uh, started running Slinky down in Bournemouth. Got on my list here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I was so there. How did that come about then? Because obviously, was was that come off well, the back of like the time? end of, at the, the end of my time at Tidy, I was obviously moving more away from the harder sound and more into that more tech trance sound. And obviously, I've been at Tidy for nearly 10 years. Um, it was starting to change in terms of the whole vinyl was starting to disappear and digital was coming in. And, it, it, you know, it just felt like the right time to move. And there was the opportunity came up to work with Richard Scaife, who had previously worked with at Tidy, because uh, he was looking after Slinky at the time. So... Uh, yeah, I moved over to, to Slinky, became a resident there. Obviously ran the radio show for three years. I ran their label, set up, well, reset up the label actually and, and ran that for them um, and did all the bookings and the tours and things like that. And that was great because, it was, again, I was with a brand that was pioneering the sound that I wanted to push, yeah. so it, it worked really well. Um, and then I think I left Slinky to... Well, we finished Slinky in 2013. Um and that's when I worked or oh, moved to Gate Crash and worked for Gate Crash for a year. That was that quite surreal because obviously you, you mentioned Gate Crash before. One of one of the first clubs you used to go yeah. to when you first got into the Raven scene. You know, yeah. was it was it a bit of a bit of a it was, moment? It was to surreal. Yeah, Gate Crash was like a massive part of my life. You know, I, I went there literally every week for the best part of probably three or four years. So, um, yeah, it was very surreal. Obviously, working with with Simon Rain was quite interesting. Um, but yeah, I was there for a year. Obviously, they just bought the the Ibiza venue then, which was obviously Eden. Um, but that uh, that turned into a bit of a nightmare, really. So uh, yeah, I, I was only there for a year, and then moved and moved on and got into artist management. So what was your role in Gay Clash? Yeah? I was the booker. So initially, I worked from the Nottingham venue. So I was I would book all the acts for for Nottingham, but then they closed that venue, and then I had to move to Birmingham. And then I doing I was so I was doing the bookings for Birmingham, which was very EDM based back then. Um and then obviously then that they took over the the venue in Ibiza, did the lineups for Ibiza as well, but unfortunately uh, it didn't do very well over there and uh, it all came crumbling down. Yeah. So so working, <clears throat> excuse me, working as a booker, I imagine you you were kind of dealing predominantly with artist management personnel yeah. at the time. Was that what gave you the the, the foresight yeah, I mean, to go I've, out? I've I've always been involved to a degree with artist management, even at the time with Tidy, um, and understanding obviously the the runnings of a record label and 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 an artist profile. So, and for me at that time, I do I kind of stopped DJing because in two thousand and ten, my twins came along, and I didn't really I'd, I'd done DJing for the best part of fifteen years. I kind of had enough by then, um, so the artist management seemed to. The, the next best thing really for me to be involved still in still involved in the scene, scene yeah yeah because I still I still love the industry still want to be a part of it and I guess you know giving something back to to people that are just starting on their career journey um was the best thing for me to do and that's something that I still do today you know I'm still an artist manager now yeah so LGRP was the first venture am I right 
Yeah, so I, in, in 2014, I actually went to Fresh Artist Management, which is in Sheffield. A mate of mine, Barry, Barry Amphlett, he he took me on. He was managing like people like Judge Jules and people like that at the time, a bit more EDM-based, but I wanted to do more uh, on the underground, the more housier stuff. So I, I developed my own roster um, and managed all my own acts myself. So the likes of uh, my first signing was a guy called Max Chapman, who was an amazing tech house producer and DJ. Um, Piero Perupa, Left Wing Cody. So I, I built up a roster of about six artists um, and looked after them till I think it was 2017. Then I left Fresh, took the artists with me and set up my own management company um, called LGRP with, with two colleagues of mine, uh, a guy called Ross Canavan, who's based in LA, uh, and a guy called David Bourne, who's from Manchester. And David looks after the, all the drum and bass guys, so people like Boo and Turno, um, Ross looks got an amazing um, roster of artists, uh, really up and coming artists like Max Dean, Luke Dean, Suat. He looks after WAF. He's got a really strong roster. So between all three of us, we you know we've got I think we manage thirty seven acts now. Okay. Um, in multiple genres, uh, we've got other obviously trainee managers that work underneath us as well, and we mentor them, and they've got their own little roster of acts that they look after as well. So it's really really grown quite a big. Uh, fairly quickly, especially even you know over lockdown when yeah, a lot of DJs obviously weren't DJing or even producing music. You know it was it was quite tough. Um, but yeah, we managed to get through that, and we've we've got a a budding roster now, which is great yeah. to see. Don't forget, you can catch me each and every Thursday night for my show, Absolute Old School, only on Inderman Radio, where I play you two hours of classics and a feast of forgotten gems, usually on the harder side of the spectrum. We kick off with the early 90s every week and then we have the trans flashback section followed by the spotlight section. In the past we've featured clubs and events like Kinetic, The Drome, Good Grief, labels like Tidy Sacks, Bonsai and Shock and artists such as Ultrasonic, Tony DeVille and Scott Brown. We always finish off nice and tough with the Go Hard or Go Home section. You can catch it on In Demand Radio Thursday nights from 11pm or listen back absolutely free of charge on indemandradio.com or download the free In Demand Radio app for Apple or Android. So where did the initials LGRP come from then? I, I, I assumed it was... Well, the initially Rossi, we were DLL called Locust. Yeah, lo- we were called Locust Management and then... Um, some other uh, managers joined us. One guy called Ollie Simcock. Um, he looks after a lot of um, techno acts, so people like Spectre, Pleasurecraft. Um, Spectre, never heard of them. No, no, no. <laughs> I call my dick because he's the right one. Um, and then we've got another, uh, obviously, David with his um, drum and bass acts. So they had their own management companies. So they wanted to keep their own identities. So we just changed it to L- LGRP. So it's Locus Group. Yeah. So that's the overhanging business. And then we've okay. got we've got Locus Management. We've got it's Inside the Night. And then um, all this all this management company as well. Yeah. Do you get, do you get a, a, a more of a reward and feeling from, from artist management than you do from actually running your own uh, projects? Uh, like it's, that? A different, it's a different thing because when, you, when you're looking after somebody else's career it's obviously you're investing your time in somebody else's dream yeah so you've got to really um so i was having this conversation the other day you you really got to buy into who they are and what yeah. they're doing to really do your job properly because you know you've got to be really dedicated to it because an artist manager is not it's not an easy job it's not a nine to five it's yeah. uh you know you can you work you know i was at the peak when i was managing seven artists all of whom were you know, touring internationally, touring on a weekly basis. You know, you know, you get up at seven a.m. and you're talking to people in Australia, and then you're working through your normal working day, and then at night you're speaking to people in America and in that side of the pond. So you're literally on your phone twenty four seven. Um, and it got to the point where it, it it kind of took over my life for a bit. I'd speak to my artist more than my wife. Yeah. Um, but that's what you have to do. You have to be dedicated to it and. Yeah. It, it paid off because obviously all the acts that I managed had incredible, incredible careers and have done really well, won awards and got major record deals and, you know, phenomenal times. It's only been really in the last 18 months when I've kind of reduced my roster down from the six, seven DJs that I was looking after. I'm just looking after two now, which is 
left wing Cody, sorry, three left wing Cody, Paul Clark, and BK. Yeah. Um, so I look after those guys now, um, and as well as other things. Yeah, I was. I've actually reached out to Ben to try and get him on the podcast. Uh, it'd be fantastic yeah, yeah. to get him on. I know he, yeah. he spoke to a friend of mine, um, Brad, Brad Refresh, and he, yeah. he invited Brad invited Ben on, onto the podcast. But Ben can only do it via Zoom. Now Brad's got this thing where he likes to do the podcast face to face, which I understand. It, it is a, yeah. a better dynamic. But Ben was like, "Well, you know, where I live and where you live, it's, it's not going to work." Yeah, yeah. So I said, yeah. "I said to Brad, well, you know, I'm going to ask him now about you because I do mine on Zoom." Yeah, <laughs> why not? So give uh, give Ben a nudge for us if you don't mind. I will, mate. Yeah, definitely, no problem. <laughs> so North Star 360, tell us a little bit about that, please, mate. Okay, North Star uh, was an idea that Andy Pickles uh, and Emma Stakes came up with, um, who we work with at Tile Yard North uh, in Wakefield, where our office is now. Uh, and effectively, it's it's a record label, but um, first and foremost, but our our focus is very much on um, being a, a talent incubator for for young aspiring artists. So, whereas most record li- labels sign it already established artists, we give yeah, opportunities to to younger kids, and it goes back to what we were saying earlier on um, about what it's like in school. You know, my kids love music. They're totally disengaged with music at school because it's so fucking archaic and just yeah, pianos it, and flutes not a and recorders. Of what, yeah, yeah, it's, it's you know, and don't get me wrong, you know, playing an instrument has got its place, no problem with that. But what we do is that we get we provide a three step process of for kids between the ages of thirteen and seventeen to understand what it is like to be in the music industry. So um, the starting point of all this is what we call a development camp. So. We actually did a pilot with Wakefield Council uh, last August where they funded the the, 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 the week-long development camp. And we we had 30 kids um, from all over Wakefield, from different wards, different backgrounds, all of whom have got an understanding and want to be in the music industry. So they're either looking at going to college to do music or they're in a band or whatever. Yeah. Um, all of these kids had to go through an application process <clears throat> Um which is on a, a platform called Star Profile, which is in m- most schools throughout the UK. So we asked them specific questions about their background and what they want to do, and we filtered all the applications down to thirty kids. They came into our into our facility on a Monday morning. None of them knew who each other was. Some of them even, you know, uh, there was one girl in particular who suffered from quite bad autism, and literally she wouldn't even look at you in the eye and say a word to you on the on the Monday morning. Yeah, and then. We gave them uh, to make, we've got to make these things as engaging as possible at the same time without getting too in depth in some of the um, the nitty gritty of it so that they get become disengaged. So yeah. we give them a, a sync brief. Now, a sync brief is what a lot of um, film production companies hand out to, to publish, music publishers and artists across all over the world. So uh, the, the sync brief that we got was from the Stranger Things series. So straight away, kids are engaged because it's... Of course, strange. yeah. And now the, the brief is, okay, well, in Series 5, it, they obviously do it all about years. So in Series 5, it's the year 1987. We want these five records from 1987, and we want them reimagining. Now, when I say reimagining, it means they're, they're flipping the hit. They're going to take a journey record... That is, you know, a popular record, but we're going to make a chill out version for it because they want that version for a specific scene in right. the series. Yeah. So straight away, you've got the 30 kids, we divide them into five groups uh, and they've all got a lead producer and they go off into the studios and they learn how to reimagine a track for the Stranger Things series. And they do that throughout the whole week. They learn the process of music production. They play instruments on it. They sing on them. There's, there's an amazing kid who was on the course who played the guitar like with his slash. He was incredible. Yeah. <laughs> he was only 16. Wow. So they're all there, hands-on, making this music. And along the way throughout the course, we've got industry insight talks. So people that work in the industry come in, talk to them about, for instance, social media, how to promote yourself as an artist. We had a talk on artist management about understanding the industry and what you need to do. Basically, allowing the kids to understand that, yeah, you know, not everyone in the music industry will make it as a successful artist. Yeah. In fact, about 1% do. Yeah. 
So, but behind those artists and in the industry as a whole, there is an absolute myriad of jobs that you can get involved in. Just because you might fail at one thing doesn't mean you can't do it. Yeah. And at the end of the day, most people in the in the music industry as well have started off doing something, but have yeah. gone on to do several different things like myself. Like but yourself, yeah, I was about to say that then. It, it's the, but it's the path that a lot of people do yeah. take in the music industry. But kids don't understand that, you see. They think, well, if I don't make it as an artist, I've got to go and get a job yeah. elsewhere. And that's not the case. Yeah. So obviously throughout this week's development camp, um, one of the one of the things that they do is, um, okay, guys, you're, you're in your group, you're doing this track. I want you to imagine that you're all in a band together and you're releasing this track. We want you to come up with a name for your band and I want you to design a logo for that band. So they did. So they all got the, they all drew their ideas out and then they worked with Ammo and our creative team and made the actual logo and the wow. artwork for their release. And then at the end of this week, they finished the tracks. We'd play all the tracks to an industry panel on Zoom a lot of which, you know, were the, the the publishers who looked after these tracks and the and the producers from the Stranger Things series. So it's like, you know, you, this this type of experience is just unheard of. You know yeah, I mean? of course, yeah. And then at the end of it, we surprised the kids and said, "Well, you know what we're going to do? We're going to release these tracks and we're going to put them onto Spotify." And we wow. did that. But now the kids ah. are going back to school and going, "Look, I've got a song that, on Spotify." That, that's me playing the guitar on that, yeah, and I did that logo as well, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, it, it was an amazing experience for them. And then, and then the girl that I mentioned earlier, who wouldn't say boo to a goose because she was just so frightened, at the end of the the week she's best mates with everyone she's like talking her parents came in were like thank you so much for what you've done for our daughter because she's just she's like a different person and that's the power of what these types of things can do and now we've got all these 30 kids now wanting to do right what what i want to do something else now so the next phase for them is what we call skill programs so if you've done the development camp then you go through to the next stage you go all right i want to do an eight-week course on songwriting or an eight-week course on film and photography or an eight-week course on music production and they're the more nighttime a bit more in depth you know really learning and understanding those in a lot more detail um and then once they've done those the, the next phase of that is more industry understanding so we teach music law and things like that so by the time you're 17 you have a full understanding of what it's like to be in the industry Wow, and then where they're, the they're fuck were you 35 years ago when I was in school? Well, exactly, and, and me too, because now these kids, the whole idea is that there's always the next stage to it. You go, you do the development camps, the skill programs, the industry understanding. Once you've done that third course, you've built your networks of people. You know people in the industry. We can provide internships with people like Warner and Sony and Universal and all these cool place, places to work. It's You wouldn't be able to do that unless... You you wouldn't know even know where to start. Exactly, yeah. And that's and that's why these courses are so important for, because unless we do these types of things, it's going to get it's going to be more and more difficult to get people into the creative industries yeah. because it's just seemed a lot of people in the north, especially like, well, if I want to get in the music industry, I have to move to London, and you you don't. There's you know there's lots and lots of people that work in the music industry in the north of england so i, I think that's what a, we do basically in, yeah. in a long-winded way but <clears throat> listen that, that that's uh, i mean first and foremost my, my first question would be is that something you're going to roll out to, to further feel because that yeah. that's a fantastic opportunity yeah. That. yeah well the plan is is like we've we've just done a um the next step is we need the funding to, in order to do this so We've got a three-year plan. Uh, we'd like to put seven between seven hundred and fifty and a thousand kids through the through the three stage program in the next three years. In order to do that, we need to raise a million quid. Yeah. So we're in the process now of talking to a lot of major record labels, sponsors, funding pots in order to raise that money so that we can put the kids through. Um, at the minute, obviously, the pilot that we did was very much Wakefield based, but we're talking to people in Hull Council, Sheffield, Doncaster, Barnsley. But that, you know, we can open this up to anybody. You know, just because it's called North Star 360 doesn't mean that, you know, any yeah. anybody can't reply, um, apply for it. So, well, that's that's the end game. So, we're just working hard on that at this stage. I would imagine you, you, you I mean, I'm not telling you how to do your job at all, by the way, but the likes of like Fender and Pioneer and Roland yeah. and stuff like that, they're companies that would like to get involved. Yeah, you know, yeah. We're, they're, we're their stuff's going to be at the guys, forefront yeah. when, when it all yeah. kicks off. Yeah, no, 100%. Yeah, they're, they're the types of people that we're having conversations with now. So, yeah. yeah. Absolutely Fingers fantastic. Crossed. I think the sad thing with the music industry now is 
unfortunately, a, a lot of people get disarmed when they watch like of your X Factors and your Britain's Got Talent because it, it's so unfair. You'll see someone with, with, with real genuine talent, yeah, and they don't get through because the novelty one gets through, or or the one whose nan's died, or you know, or yeah, 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 the yeah, girl yeah. with one arm or whatever. You know, it's 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 sad because. I've seen that so many times where genuine talent hasn't got through. And I always, yeah. I always think that person must be fucking crushed there thinking, yeah. wow, I got beat well, by a fellow. That's with a one of the things that we me. teach, you know, we teach in the, in the course that, you know, the music industry is brutal at times, you know, and you have to be thick skinned and you will get a lot more no's than you do yeses. But that's course, part, yeah. part of love it. You know, you, you, it's how you take that on board and how you deal with it that counts. Yeah. And as you said before, you know, it's, it's not always a case of, well, I haven't made it as a singer now, so that that's me done. Because there's lots of people in the industry you probably know a lot more than I do who, who've had maybe one hit wonders, and you think, oh, they've never been heard from again. And what you yeah. don't know is they're behind the scenes doing, they, they, you know, they, they've got the behind One Direction and the 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 writing songs for Pink and they're doing yeah, this and this that. Is it. <clears throat> and and you know, this is heightened by the fact now, and it goes back to what I was saying earlier about the whole music industry has changed so much, especially since COVID. Is the fact that. Before, you uh, being an artist was just writing music or being a DJ. Now you have to be a social media expert. You know, you have to have all these strings to your bow. And unfortunately, unless if you're not great at social media or you don't promote yourself in the right way, it's very difficult to get noticed. Yeah. That's why a lot of record labels are probably being quite lazy now. They're picking up people on things like TikTok because... If they've got a big fan base already and they're already it's, doing it's well, it's a ready-made audience, isn't it? All their work's done for them. Yeah. It's easy, and yeah. it's, it's it has become a bit lazy in that sense for A and R in artists and breaking through because it's it's become now more about a popularity contest than it has about talent and music. But that's the world we live in, unfortunately. Yeah, so you know you have to embrace those things and and work hard at um, promoting yourself and building your fan base at the very very start and get yourself into that routine of doing that because it's going to be a, it's a necessary evil at the end of the day. Of course it is, yeah. So we're going to backtrack a little bit now and talk about a little bit more about Tidy. Because obviously a lot, a lot of my listeners will, will know you from, from Tidy Tracks. <laughs> yeah. So do you remember the first time the conversation was had about doing a Tidy Weekend there? Um, I, I don't remember. The, I, remember the, I remember the first event very, very well. I mean, yeah. we, I think we actually went in there with no expectations whatsoever. Yeah. And I don't think, no, numbers-wise, I think we only had about 1,800 people there. And the, when we look back now at the production that we had, and it was it <laughs> looked quite bare boned when you consider what the scale of what we do now. Yeah. Um, but we were t- obviously taken aback by the feedback that we had from the first one, and then the second one sold out in like a matter of days. So we knew we were obviously clearly onto something. And no one, there were obviously weekender events like obviously Soul Weekenders and something like that, but no no brand like us had done anything like that before. So. But that was tidy all over, really. You know, we were the first ones in Magna. You know, we always like to be the first first brand to do uh, a new venue and yeah. to, to do something a bit outside the box because that's what we like to do. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you know, if, if you said to me 24 years on, we'd still be doing them, and I'd probably laughed at you at that. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, they're great events, and yeah, we're um, we're very, very lucky to to have them. Tidy TV, how did that come most? Because that, that was one of <laughs> well, the highlights. That that's was a, ammo, that's that's, I don't know I'm not surprised. That's got fucking ammo's name written all over. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's his mind. Um, it's but again, but again, that's what it was. But, you don't want to know what goes on in his mind. So, uh, some some things I, I dread to think. But um, yeah, it's that's part and parcel of the weekend experience. That's what it made really it. Is. So, and, and we didn't have to do that. You know, we could have quite easily just booked some DJs and let them get on with it. But the whole experience. For us, it was about the experience. So you know, bringing people like Keith Chegwin in and and doing game <laughs> shows and uh, you know, uh, bloody sports days, and we've done all sorts of crazy yeah. stuff, bingo, and it's you know we didn't have to do that, but it that is what creates the memories. And Tidy TV was not only a great advertising tool for what we were doing as a label, but just to be daft yeah. and have a bit of laugh, and you know, some of the things that we, we've done, uh, you know, funnily enough, know, I was I was. Early <clears> I was actually watching the film Sexy Beast last night with the missus because there's a TV show out which is a prequel to the film. And right. the first time I seen a clip of Sexy Beast, 
was on Tidy TV. All right. Ben Kingsley. No, 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 no. So we were watching that last night, and I just thought I was sitting on the couch thinking it's funny how it's got, things go full circle. Yeah, and then yeah. Sitting, talking to Lee Haslam tomorrow <laughs> about Tidy TV was the first yeah. time I'd seen this on. But yeah. I, I always um, when we when we used to watch Tidy TV, I always I remember feeling sorry for you because like you were the butt yeah, of some of the jokes, and I. I I, obviously, I didn't understand how, how, how pivotal your role was in Tidy. And I just yeah. thought, he's the fucking taking the piss out of this fella here. I mean, oh, I, it was, I, it's I, a I prerequisite. It was in the contract. Yeah. I loved it, though. I loved it. it, was, it I was always the stooge. Spazlum, Lee Spazlum. Lee Spazlum. That, that was Madders that called me that. That was, was it, yeah. Yeah. Oh, the one I always remember was the one where you turned up a week early. Week early. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the most famous one, really. <laughs> the, the fruit and veg shop's quite a good one as well. Yeah, oh, it's a good time. Really good time. Oh, mate, they were just how we kept a straight face half the time is beyond me. But <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I look back at those times with very, very fond memories. I've actually got the DVD in my loft. Uh, the yeah, time yeah. Kind of DVD. And I'm, actually, I'm actually on it. You see me walking well, mate, in. That's what that. I mean. It's like, you know, we used to put a lot of money into Tidy TV, you know what I mean? But it, it, obviously we made a project out of it that we could release. We, like, we had Tidy Vision and all the, all the amazing people that were involved in it, like Dave Doldrop, who did the bulk of it all, and Amo's Mind and just everyone getting involved. <laughs> Not just me, but everyone would get involved and, you know, take, take the piss out of themselves. Who was the fella you used to have on? Um... Oh, the fucking the, the Yorkshire rapper fellow, what was his name? Oh, I, I, yeah, I know you mean. Do you know what I mean, yeah? Yeah, I know fucking you mean. Mid, mid, oh, he was fucking hilarious. Yeah. That's yeah. Like the first time I'd seen him. I was on time, and he actually was dead. At one point, I wasn't eternal. No. Yeah, he was talked to Lisa that's... at one point. I don't think it went down very well. <laughs> yeah. I found some gas that I got, I got sampled, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, now, good times. Right, yeah. so before you go, you explore Limited as your newest venture. Do you want to give us a yeah. little t- talk about that? Well, you, you explore is actually, um, it's part and parcel of North Star, really. I got the, the, that, yeah. the, the, the infrastructure that um, we use to onboard all the kids for the North Star camps is is the U Explore background. So U Explore is a, an educational a platform that's in all of schools across the UK. So if if a kid in school wants to learn about, we meet some of the industry partners that they've got are like Coca Cola, BP, um, EDF, Manchester City Football Club. You've got a, 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 a vast array of yeah, um, yeah. lawyers on there. So if you're a kid in school and you think, right, I'm I'm thinking about le- wanting to join the fire service, then you can go on there and there's little um tutorials and and information about how they can apply for certain courses and this all came about because obviously we use start platform to onboard all the kids for the north star camps so north star is a a company that's on start start profile so it's coming full circle for me getting back into education again really yeah so i'm i'm helping andy with that at the minute as well which is which is cool and it ties into what we said before as well you know you you, you you're very much filling a gap in the market because as we said, the school the school system doesn't really yeah, cater. Yeah. You, know, I, you never got taught how to apply for jobs, stuff like that. Yeah. Well, there's oh, there's a lot of like things like internships and apprenticeships that a lot of companies offer now. So we work with them and give the kids that use start profile startprofile dot com. Uh, you can go on there and you can get an insight into, um, like for instance, if um, BP for example are doing an an apprenticeship, they can we can work with them and help them target specific kids that have done well in some of the tutorials that we've done, yeah. help them, help them engage better with Get uh, the right man for the job type thing. Yeah, exactly. Or, or, or woman, obviously. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotta put that in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I know you're a very busy man, Lee, so I'm going to finish off now with some quick fire questions because I know you've got a lot of work. Okay. Right, Go Lee Haslam, I will take your first answer and your first answer only. Are you ready? Okay. Bath or shower? Shower. What superpower would you have? Um, I don't know. Uh, fly <laughs> on chips, ketchup, or mayonnaise. Ketchup. What is your worst habit? Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's, that's me whack that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not slipping into your wife's DMs now. Yeah. Like, fuck that. <laughs> Honestly, mate, um, my worst habit probably procrastinating. <laughs> what scares you? Um, nothing really. I don't think. Ooh, look at you, little fucking. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I can't think of that. I'm past. Okay, 
Are you on death row? What's your what, what's your final meal request? Oh, probably Sunday dinner. Yeah, full roast. What meat? Yeah. Um, probably roast beef. Oof. Yorkshire pudding. How would you like? How would you like your beef though? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Rare. laughs> Rocky yeah. three or Rocky four? Four. Who would you most like to collaborate in a studio with, dead or alive? Tony to be. Oh yeah. Proudest musical achievement so far? Uh, being nominated for a Brit. Yeah. What was that for? Oh, which was, was real really note. surreal, by the way. Well, it was really that how that whole came about was I think we got this magazine sent through from the Brit Awards, and what they do is they before they announce the the like the six that obviously go on to then win it, they do short lists of like, of I think 30 or 40 names. And uh, I can't remember who it was at the time. I think it was Sue Green who we worked who worked in the tidy office and she was looking through it. And then the breakthrough artist was me. And he said, Lee Haslam, liberate. And I was like, what? <laughs> and it was, we all, I thought it was a wind up at the start, but no. Yeah, I, it's fucking ammo again. <laughs> no, I, that's my, yeah, I'm proud of that. Okay, I'm not surprised. Really. I will be yeah. so. Van Damme or Jackie Chan? Jackie Chan. You go into a fully stocked shop, what's your go-to chocolate bar? Dairy milk. Dead or alive, who would you like to go and watch in concert? I would have loved to have gone to watch in excess. Yeah. When Michael Hutchins was a, was alive, definitely. Of course, yeah. Um, what are you currently watching on Netflix or other, um, other platforms yeah. that are available? Um, Masters of the Sky on, on Apple TV. Very good. It's amazing. Pineapple on a pizza, yes or no? Yeah. Dead or alive, who would you like to have dinner with? Um, uh, my real dad, actually, he passed away about uh, last year, and then obviously I never really got to, to, to see him since I was younger, so that would have been probably my dad. Yeah. And what's the best podcast you've ever been on? Yeah, of course, this one. <laughs> See, I'll say that. You can snip it that and use it on social media. <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to. Right, so what have you got coming up, Danny? Any project coming up? This is probably going to yeah, go out. Um, I'm going to I'm going to say March. This this one should be out. Okay. Um, well, I'm just I'm just putting the final touches to a new single. Okay. Working on for the past few weeks, so that's um, that'll probably be out early summer, I would imagine. What kind of style is that then? Same, like hard, yeah, trance harder tech, well. tech trance. It's a bit of a bit of a hybrid, actually. But yeah, yeah I'm really pleased with it. That's coming together. Um, obviously, just carrying on with the North Star stuff and 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 artist management. I know um, BK who I manage has got some amazing music coming up, so working a lot on that. Uh, Left Wing Cody, who I manage, they've got some really big, big music coming out this summer. So that's keeping me busy. Um, Is DJ not a thing for you anymore? Do you not DJ anymore? I've got a gig uh, in a couple of weeks in my hometown in Donny, and then I'm okay. playing for Storm. Um, I'm playing for Storm on May the twenty fifth, um, and I think I've got another gig towards the back end of the year. But yeah, I don't really play out that much these days. It's not something so. you're pursuing any much more about the, no, other, really. if, the if, if the gigs come in, if the gigs come in, then I'll I'll take a take a view on it. But it's not something I'm actively pushing now. Fantastic, Lee. Once again, mate, I really appreciate your time and your stories. Uh, it's no it's a real honour to speak to you. Like I say, yeah. uh, I, you know, you, you've been, been been there for so long. You know, at the time we had the fire, you, you're one of the main men. So it's, yeah. it's a real honour to have you on the show. So thank you so, so much for your time. You're Guys, welcome. as I've always said, I don't know who or what's next. Hopefully... Hopefully we'll get Ben, ben on. Yeah. BK. Hopefully we'll get I'll BK give him a on. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to have a little quick, quick chat to Lee now before he goes. Uh, but yeah, we'll be back in three weeks' time, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget, if you've enjoyed this show, go back. There's 40 plus episodes to watch. I've spoken to a, a, a whole load of artists, local artists, legends, legends in the scene from the hardcore scene, the hard dance scene, and, and local talent as well. So if you've enjoyed this one, go back, Spotify, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, Apple Music, Amazon Music, Spotify, YouTube, all that good stuff, and I'll see you in three weeks' time. Take care, guys. Thank you.